Uh, I heard a, a where I read a story this week about uh, a guy named Edwin Lanzier, and I'd never really heard of him uh, until this week. But apparently, he was a very famous painter during the Victorian era, and his talent developed early. And he had the first showing of his work at the Royal Academy when he was just 13 years old, and he was com uh, commissioned to do a number of portraits for the royal family. And he even gave private drawing lessons to Queen Victoria. Uh, but he was best known for his, his paintings of natural settings and uh, of life in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, most of the paintings that I've seen tended to be about paintings of dogs and deer and horses and this beautiful scenery around. Well, this painter, Edwin Lanzier, one day he was visiting a, a family in an old mansion in Scotland, and one of the servants spilled a pitcher of soda water on the wall, and it left this huge stain on the wall. Well, while the family was out for the day, Lanzier remained behind, and using charcoal, he incorporated that stain into a beautiful drawing. And when, his, when the family returned, instead of a stain on the wall, they found a, a picture of a waterfall surrounded by trees and animals. He used his skills to make something beautiful out of what was an ugly mess. Reminds me of a, a chorus we used to sing in church. Uh, I think it was a Gaither chorus and it went something like this. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. That's a great, a great song because it's, there's a truth in there about what Jesus does. Jesus takes our lives with all their flaws, their mistakes, the messiness of what we call life. And he looks right through it all. And despite the mess, he says, come follow me. And when we follow him, he begins this work in our lives in which he begins to make something beautiful of who we are. It doesn't matter who we are or what we've done. Jesus invites us to follow him. And that is amazing. The king of all kings, think about this, the king of all kings has invited me and he's invited you to follow him. Not only that, to, but to become his son, to be adopted into his family. That is simply amazing. We are enough for Jesus and he is more than enough for us. And that's important because we live in a world uh, where we are bombarded with messages that quite honestly sometimes make us feel like we're not enough. Society has these ideas about the perfect man or the perfect woman or the perfect look or the perfect family or the perfect ways to act or the perfect job or the perfect house. But the truth is I've only ever met one perfect person. His name is Jesus. So we hear these messages and, and people are often left feeling like we are not enough. And you know what that is? That's, that's shame. Shame can come from a lot of things. Sometimes shame comes from cultural expectations. Sometimes it comes from these deep-seated self-esteem issues. Sometimes it come, can come from abuse or trauma. Sometimes we feel it over real offenses, things we've done. And sometimes we feel it as a sense of guilt over things that truly were out of our control. And yet in Jesus, we find that he offers us more than enough. He offers us more than enough grace, more than enough love, more than enough to become whole, healthy, forgiven and sanctified children of God.
children of the king. You, <clears throat> all of you, us, we are called to be princes and princesses in his kingdom. You're called to be part of the kingdom of the whosoever. Why do I call it the who, kingdom of the whosoever? Because the, the old King James translation of John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Those who follow Jesus are called to be the whosoever. And the whosoever truly means whosoever. It's not a kingdom of the perfect. It's not a kingdom of the best. It's not the best of the best. It's the kingdom of the whosoever. And I'm proud to be part of that because in the kingdom of the whosoever, we are adopted into the royal family by his sacrifice. It's not about are we good enough? Are we worthy enough? Because we're not. But his grace is more than enough. That's the family we're invited to be part of. Today's scripture is found in John chapter 2. <clears throat> Just before this, Jesus has been calling his disciples. He's been gathering, he's begun his ministry. It's the very beginning. He's called a few people to follow him. And now in our scripture today, he finds himself at a wedding. Jesus and these few disciples that he has, they're joined by other friends for a wedding celebration. We don't know anything about the couple getting married, but they were probably a rather ordinary couple. We don't know their names. Uh, but I, one thing I'm pretty sure of, like most weddings, it wasn't perfect. Like most weddings, not every detail turns out the way we expect. But for this couple, in this moment, something amazing happened. And I'm not sure if they even ever knew about it. But this couple was blessed by the miraculous. And this couple's uh, problem that arises at their wedding is transformed into something amazing. For one reason, they invited Jesus to the wedding. Jesus was invited, and that changed everything. So John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they don't have any wine. And Jesus replied, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time has not yet come. His mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby were six stone water jars used for uh, the Jewish cleansing ritual. Each was able to hold about 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, uh, now draw some from, draw some from this water that you've just filled, draw some from, from them and take it to the head waiter. And they did. And the head waiter tasted the wine or he tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom and said, everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second rate stuff, uh, the second rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, Jesus and his mother, his brothers, and his disciples went down to Capernaum and stayed there for a few days. Jesus did something amazing. He turned water into wine. 
It wasn't the second rate stuff. It's funny, my uh, one of my sons, Joe, and my wife, we talk about, well, I guess both of my sons and my wife, we talk about second rate candy. And what we mean by that is we like some candy better than others. And so we have the can the good stuff, and then we have what we call the second rate stuff, which is still pretty good, but it's the second rate stuff. But, uh, and, and that's, yeah. But my point is this. Jesus took this ordinary couple's problems, and because they had invited him into their lives, everything changed. And something miraculous happened. And when they weren't enough, suddenly with Jesus, they were more than enough. Well, there are a lot of questions we could ask about this scripture. Who was this couple? Why did they run out of wine? Uh, you know, uh, they're kind of unknown. A wedding celebration was an, an important deal, not only for that family, but for the community around them. Uh, the fact that Mary and Jesus were there makes me uh, think possibly this was a relative of, of Mary and Jesus. Maybe, we don't know. Um, was it a friend of Mary? Maybe. Um, one of the things we do know about Cana is that we know that, that Jesus lived in Nazareth. And a lot of his ministry, as we'll see going forward, takes place uh, in Galilee, um, or in Capernaum, which is in, in the Galilee area. And halfway between Nazareth and Capernaum is Cana. So this may very well be a place that, that this family stopped regularly. Every time they went back and forth to Capernaum, maybe they had friends and family there. And, uh, you know, this wedding was something special. The, the whole family, uh, or the whole... Uh, much of the community would have turned out for this wedding with them. Um, weddings were, were something special. One of the things that was really special in the culture Jesus grew up in was they had a very high view of hospitality. They had a very high view of what you might call reciprocity. In other words, if I invite you to my uh, to my wedding or to my son's wedding and I put on a good wedding, then you need to invite me to your wedding or your son's wedding and you need to return the favor, so to speak. So this kind of put, would put some pressure on trying to have a good wedding. Well, here's another thought. Jesus didn't come alone. He brought his disciples with him. And I have to ask myself, Jesus had just met these guys. He just asked them to follow him. And now he brings uh, uh, some guests, four guests, uh, I think, to, uh, to this wedding. And, you know, I'm thinking, I think most weddings that you or I would go to if we brought guests with us just out of the blue, that's kind of frowned upon. You know, you, you get an invitation, and you come, and you don't bring people that weren't invited. But, um, and, and, you know, it's one of those things where if Jesus shows up and he's got people with him, and, if, it, you know, it's hard to say, well, you can come, but your friends can't. But bottom line is I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Jesus bringing ex, extra people, did this add to the reason why they ran out of wine? Perhaps running out of wine was, was uh, simply a mistake. They didn't buy enough. They didn't order enough. Perhaps the family wasn't wealthy enough to afford more wine. Either way, they ran out, and this was a big deal for this culture, this time, this society. There would have been a certain amount of shame involved with running out of wine. And the, their, their culture revolves so much around hospitality and, and returning the favor that it would have been a very difficult thing, an embarrassing thing, perhaps a shameful thing for that, that couple to begin their lives together with something like running out of wine at the wedding. And the truth is, the way these small towns work, 
Everybody would have remembered that. They would always be the couple that ran out of wine at their wedding. Praise the Lord, now they're remembered. The couple who had, uh, who saved the best one for last. Or as we know, the couple who invited Jesus to their wedding. There's, there's whole sermons in that idea right there about inviting Jesus to your wedding, inviting Jesus into your marriage. Uh, think about that. But this couple, they could have always been remembered for running out of wine. And you know, marriage was a contractual thing in that society. If you were, let's say it was the father of the bride who, who was responsible for putting on this wedding and making sure they have enough wine. <clears throat> we'll say it was the couple themselves. That if it was the father, he had other children that he needed to marry. How would running out of wine at this wedding affect him getting his other children married? Or for this couple themselves, if, if they had children, if they were remembered for one, running out of wine, would that have an effect on them trying to marry off their children if everybody remembered? These are the kids of the one who uh, ran out of wedding, uh, ran out of wine. There was all these things that, that could go along with this. And I guess I bring them up to point out that this was kind of a big deal. And maybe we, we wouldn't necessarily see it that way because we're in a different time, in a different place, in a different uh, culture. There was a, a chief steward or a chief waiter. Somebody was there whose job it was to try to run this wedding. You might call him a wedding planner, I guess. Would he ever work again after running out of wine? How would this affect him? There were a lot of people whose lives could have been affected, affected negatively because they simply ran out of wine at a wedding. And you know, there's a lot of things in our world that seem like small problems, but can have all these repercussions for so many people, all stemming from one thing that happened. Good news, good news for this couple. Jesus was there. Good news for us, Jesus is there. There was not enough wine. Maybe there wasn't enough joy. Maybe the couple was not enough. Or the family wasn't enough. But Jesus was more than enough. And I say that because the truth is, who of us, is enough. Jesus is more than enough. They probably had some, they had these vessels, these, these stone uh, vessels that were for, they used for water for the ceremonial washing. They probably, when Jesus turned that water into wine, that was probably somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. I don't know how many people were at that wedding, but I expect that was way more wine than they needed. Because Jesus is more than enough. With Jesus, we never have to worry about, about being enough. Because Jesus deals in abundance. When he is, in, when he is involved, abundance flows. When we are not enough, he makes us more than enough. There's this mother and son moment we find in this scripture. And it's really kind of interesting. And I, when I read this scripture, I, I try to picture Mary and Jesus as, as, you know, they're human beings. Jesus was, was fully God and fully human. Mary was was. She was a pretty ordinary woman in some respects, but God saw that she was something special and she was blessed to be the mother of Jesus. And we have this conversation between a mother and her son. And uh, Mary tells Jesus they're out of wine. And his response is interesting. His response is, woman, what does that have to do with me? And uh, he says, my time has not yet come. 
There's a few things that stick out about that conversation that was in, in verses three to five. First of all, Jesus calls his mom woman. And uh, we need to understand that he's not being rude. In fact, he is, he's being polite, sort of, because they use what we translate as, as woman. Uh, they use in that culture kind of the way we use man. If you were uh, in a store and there was a the person in front of you in the checkout line dropped something, you might say, ma'am, you dropped something because you're being polite and respectful. Um, that's kind of how Jesus is using the word woman here, kind of like we use man. But that's still kind of strange because we usually don't call our own mother ma'am. Maybe as a kid, you, you said, yes, ma'am, uh, or, or something like that. But generally, we call her our mother's mother or mom. We don't call them ma'am. That seems a little distant. And so there's something odd about this conversation. And he uses this phrase that is sometimes translated, what is that to you and me? And it was a, just kind of a phrase in that, in that culture that meant, well, that's none of our, it's none of my business. And Jesus says, my time has not yet come. Because Jesus was working on this godly timeline. The crucifixion and the resurrection lay ahead of him in his future. But he had much ministry to do between this point and then. It wasn't time for him to do a big public uh, miracle because that would have sped up his journey to the cross. This amazing miracle is more of a behind the scenes type of thing. There must have been uh, quite a few people who saw it, but it likely would have created a whisper of a rumor, not newsworthy of like healing somebody in the middle of town which you would do later. This was kind of a on the, on the DL, on the quiet miracle. Something special he did for this couple who invited him into their lives. Mary tells the servants, do what he says. And man, that, that could be a whole sermon. Jesus, do what he says. Mary doesn't know how Jesus will fix this, but she trusts him. She knew, what did she think he was gonna do? I, I doubt very much that she knew exactly what he was going to do, but you know what? He was Jesus. He was the one that the, that the angels had told her about. She knew he was something special. She, might not, she may not have known how, but she knew he would do something because she trusted him. She trusted Jesus. And she tells the servant that he should also trust him. Do what he asks, trust him. Kind of reminds me of uh, the end of the previous chapter, chapter one. Uh, that chapter ends with Jesus beginning to call his disciples, uh, he gathered, he, he calls uh, Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel and maybe one other. And uh, when calling his disciples, Jesus uses the language of invitation. He doesn't tell them exactly what's happening. He doesn't tell them exactly what it's going to look like to follow him. He certainly doesn't tell him yet that he's headed to the cross. They probably wouldn't have followed. But you know what he says? He says, come and see. He says, follow me. And that's what he still says to us today. We, we look to Jesus and we don't know how things are going to turn out. We don't know how things can change. We don't know how it's going to work. But Jesus says, come and see. 
Follow me. Trust me. And I think if you ask people that have been following Jesus for a number of years, he's always faithful. He's always faithful. Being a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Jesus is all about trust. Do you trust him? At the wedding in Cana, Mary trusted her son. And she told the servants, do whatever he tells you, trust him. Because trusting Jesus leads to abundance. God's grace never runs out. This miracle of turning the water into wine looks forward to what Jesus was now heading towards. The world's collective sin was too much. The Jewish sacrificial system was not enough. The law was not enough. These water vessels represented the, the law and its, its purification rituals. They would have had these, these, these big things of, of water and somebody would have, would, have, they would have scooped water out and poured them on their hands as a ceremonial hand washing, a cleansing. Something about water being poured out represented cleansing. Those rituals weren't enough. When Jesus uses those vessels, he makes them bearers of something that's better than water, something that's greater than the law. The water became wine. The law became Jesus' blood shed on the cross for the sins of the world. Where the law was not enough, the grace and the love of Jesus poured out on the cross was way more than enough. It was abundant. I remember one time uh, I had gone to a prayer summit. And this was, when I say prayer summit, I think it was like eight guys in a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. Tons of snow. Uh, we were kind of roughing it. It wasn't a, it was just somebody's hunting cabin. And we were doing communion together. And so it's a fairly small room with a fairly small group of people. And it was quiet because we were doing communion. And we used pretty normal cups to do communion, not the little communion cups. We had bigger cups, you know, like normal cups. And when I went to, when we were doing communion and I went to drink uh, the grape juice representing the blood of Christ, I gulped. And it was so quiet that everybody heard me gulp. And I don't remember what was said or what was heard, but I thought to myself, it's okay to gulp, you know why? Because Jesus' grace, his bloodshed was more than enough for the sins of the world. In Jesus, we find love. Our lives are, are taken to another level. Where we fail, he reigns. Where we have sinned, he brought holy love. Jesus takes our failings, our problems, our weaknesses, our strengths, and our mistakes and despite all of them, he says, come follow me. And when we follow him, we find we are more than enough in him. We are more than enough in Christ who gives us strength and hope and peace and grace. There are three things I want you to know this morning. Three simple things. One, God loves you. Two, God is inviting you to follow him. And three, his grace makes you more than enough to be a part of his royal family. Let's sing one last song as we close this one. Lord, you are the king. And we are children loved by the king. What a blessing. Lord, help us to never forget that you invite us and we, when we, in turn, invite you into our lives, everything changes. Because, Lord, with you, your grace abounds. And in you, we are more than enough. Because you are more than enough. And you provide more than enough grace and love for us. 
We give you praise and thanksgiving this morning, Lord. Help us to, to just walk deeper and deeper in your love and grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and enjoy your